We're going to wait for a few minutes and let our, uh, we're closing up one walk and learn and having some people walk over from that walk and learn to this one. Um, but we're uh, joining you from the Moravian Archives today, as well as from the Museum of Anthropology at uh, Wake Forest University. And we'll um, be getting our conversations in just a moment. We are, I don't know how many of you have, have, have seen other uh, aspects of our conference. We've had a really full an interesting program with some really talented people uh, contributing their skills. Andrew Minkins last night did a fabulous job weaving together lots of details. Uh, Sally Gant just now going through the fabulous collections at Mazda. Uh, had a wonderful uh, academic session, which you'll hear about on Saturday. Uh, started today going over some papers. A great introduction yesterday. More good things coming in this conference in the next day or two. Um, but my name is Eric Elliott. I am the archivist here at Moravian Archives and wanted to uh, pass the baton around and let uh, the two co-conveners from Wake Forest University for this event introduce themselves now at this time. Good afternoon. My name is Ulrike Wiethaus and I am professor of the study of religions in the department for the study of religions and also American ethnic studies. It's a great joy for all of you to join us and listen to um, this next session. Hi, my name is Grant McAllister. I am an associate professor and Levison faculty fellow in the Department of German and Russian at Wake Forest University. Welcome to our second Walk and Learn event. Uh, I'm so pleased to be uh, part of the, uh, my colleagues here, my co-conveners. So far, this uh, has been um, a, a really wonderful conference and uh, let's hope that it continues to go well and we don't have any technical issues here for this online conference. Uh, before I let the last person in our uh, video, Scott, uh, speak, I wanna introduce him today. He's a very special fellow. Uh, his name is Dr. Andrew Gustell, and he is um, an academic director at Wake Forest University's Museum of Anthropology, a wonderful place to go visit. Um, Andrew got his PhD at the University of Michigan. His interest in museums focuses on making them the hubs of anthropological research, places where research is both conducted and exhibited. And so he's in the right spot this afternoon to do both of that. He's actually in the collections there at the <laughs> Department of Anthropology. So we're so pleased to have him. You know, his research, um, he's done archeological and oral history research in West Africa, including Ghana, Togo, and Benin. He is the director of the Save uh, Save Hills. I, you'll, you'll correct me on the pronunciation as most people do with my Southern accent. Uh, Save Hills Archeological Research Project in Benin. And the project's goal is to examine the early history and development of the Shabe Yoruba Kingdom between 1600 and 1960 CE. Yeah, uh, the, the title of this conference is Becoming American. And yet we see that the title of this afternoon's Walk and Learn is something that completely inverts that. It's Becoming Moravian uh, through the eyes of the collections gathered there at the Museum of Anthropology. And now I'd like to turn our afternoon Walk and Learn session over to Dr. Gristel. Well, thank you for that introduction, Eric. And thank you, Professors Viethaus and McAllister for having me at your wonderful conference. Uh, I was so honored to be invited to uh, develop an exhibit around uh, this concept of becoming American and what, um, and what Moravian identity meant as it transformed and took on local dimensions in the new American context. Uh, and so when I was first reached out about what kind of contributions the Museum of Anthropology might be able to make, I immediately thought about a very special collection we have here. Um, one of the most interesting things about the Museum of Anthropology is that we do not really acquire anything by intention. Everything is given to us, everything is donated to us. We make advantage or we take advantage of every opportunity that is presented to us. And long before I took over as academic director, uh, back in uh, 1983, the Wachovia Historical Society was in a bind. They had these immense collections of material culture, of artifacts and objects from North Carolina, but also from all over the world. Objects that had been generated by Moravian missionaries and sent back to the home communities. However, um, taking care of 
material culture is difficult. Uh, as I like to tell all of my students, entropy is real. Uh, everything is breaking <laughs> down. And uh, I'm sure as you saw at MESDA, right, museums play a vital role mm -hmm. in preserving that material culture and that uh, material heritage. So while MESDA focuses on the American context, what to do with some of these objects that were generated in other provinces, in other parts of the world. Luckily, uh, the goodwill between our institutions meant that the Wachovia Historical Society felt comfortable uh, in trusting those collections with the Museum of Anthropology. And after a, being a long-term custodian of them, in the early 2000s, uh, uh, they were formally transferred into our collections. Uh, it's a very special collection and uh, one that I take uh, the obligation of caring for very seriously because they represent amazing evidence of the kind of connections that Moravians had with people all over the world and evidence of the transformations that Moravian mm -hmm. thought, practices, beliefs had on indigenous people. And conversely, of course, the influence indigenous people had on Moravians themselves. So um, when I was invited to create an exhibit, initially I was very excited because this was going to be my first time working with Eric to develop an exhibit for the Moravian archives, like a, a, a loan exhibit that the Museum of Anthropology could have there. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out quite so, quite so well. I'm sure we'll do it again someday. Instead, we moved the exhibit to a virtual representation. I'm going to share the link to that in our chat box right now. Uh, and so if you wish, you may, uh, you know, if, any, if at any point, I'm a little too boring. Feel free to click over there and just start reviewing uh, the museum exhibit on your own. Um, it's a really fun exhibit. I had the pleasure of working with Wake Forest students uh, who helped me develop it, helped me research it, helped choose the objects for it. Uh, and it's a small, fun little exhibit that demonstrates some of these really interesting stories, these really interesting connections and moments of transformation about how indigenous communities all over the world became Moravian. Uh, mm -hmm. As Eric stated, I kind of wanted to uh, turn the phrase of the conference on its head a little bit, uh, you know, have a little fun with it. Uh, but today, I'm, I don't want to just repeat all the hard work that the students and I put into that exhibit, uh, because it is a virtual exhibit and you're welcome to review it uh, on your own time. I'm, I'm not sure when it'll come down. It might be living on our museum website forever, depending on how long we're focusing on virtual exhibits, that is. So instead today, I wanted to focus in on just one of the five vignettes that the exhibit covers. So if you'll allow me today, um, while the exhibit is becoming Moravian, my presentation for today is just going to drill down on one cultural context, that of the story of the Moravians in southwestern Alaska and their mission among the Yupik people. This is a story as many stories are, of people from two cultures meeting and living together. It's a fascinating story, and it's one that has been told before. There's a lot of amazing uh, historical documents, uh, secondary sources, treatments of this story, and so I won't repeat it in full. But what those stories often leave out in that they are based on the diaries, official reports, receipts, ledgers, family histories, oral histories, all of those amazing sources we're all familiar with, a lot of the stories leave out the material culture. Yes, there's interest in Yupik material culture, indigenous material culture and what that means, but I'm more interested in this specific slice, this assortment of material culture that the missionaries themselves collected in Southwestern Alaska. Not only did they collect it, but they sent it back to Salem. I think that's very important. It implies some kind of intention, some level of observation and, um, and interest that goes beyond merely documenting material culture. It takes another step to go out, collect that, and then send it back for others to learn from. And I'll talk a little bit about that in its historical context of the late 19th and early 20th century. So again, here's a little preview of our browser exhibit. If you, uh, again, feel free at any point to click on over to the virtual exhibit. Uh, we are representing five different stories, the stories of the Moravians in Suriname, uh, in the Labrador coast of Canada, in Nicaragua, uh, in the southwestern Alaska, as I'll be presenting on today, as well as in Jamaica, showing some of the objects that are demonstrative, not of, you know, I don't know if there is such a thing, pristine indigenous cultures, but rather showing distinct moments of transformation 
between Moravians and the indigenous people that they lived and worked among. But our story begins in southwestern Alaska. Actually, it begins in Europe. Right? It begins in 1733 when Count Zinzendorf comes up with the idea of missions as a way of spreading, uh, of spreading the gospel, of spreading Moravian influence throughout the world. But Zinzendorf's idea of a far-flung mission wasn't necessarily that of only his own creation. Rather, he was inspired by the lecture circuits of the early 18th century. Of course, this is long before Zoom existed, long before telecommunications or mass communications or long-distance communication of any real kind existed. And so one of the most popular ways of spreading information about the other parts of the world that people did not have access to were of course traveling lecturers, people who had been there, who had seen the sites, experienced the land, and then came to tell their story about it. Two of the most influential for this story are two Inuit men by the name of Pak and Kiparok. Uh, around 17, in the 1720s, they traveled throughout Europe lecturing in courts and castles and city centers all over, uh, all over Europe, talking about their experiences uh, in Greenland and other Arctic places. Uh, and it fascinated the Europeans who heard it. And indeed, Count Zinzendorf heard them speak and became interested in what they were doing. He became very interested specifically then in sending Moravian missionaries into the Arctic to proselytize among Arctic people. This was an area that was well beyond the scope of European knowledge in the early 18th century, although having been explored by, uh, by Scandinavians and by other Europeans, it was still an area that was sparsely settled by them uh, and represented really one of these uh, far-flung corners of the world that Moravian knowledge was fairly limited on. Yet nonetheless, the idea of sending a mission there stuck. At the same time, uh, in 1771, uh, the first uh, uh, Labrador mission really got off the ground. Uh, and you'll see some of the artifacts in our exhibit that came from Labrador and made their way to Salem eventually. Uh, and in the course of living amongst Inuit people uh, in, on the Labradorian coast, uh, this idea of the Eskimo culture came into being. This was really one of the first um, kind of ethnographic or anthropological documentations of Arctic peoples. Uh, missionaries were, in a sense, the first ethnographers to go in and try to understand from an indigenous point of view, as well as from their own uh, European point of view, what life was like for people living in the Arctic. And although there were many uh, problems, many, many stereotypes, right, especially with the name Eskimo itself, the idea of Arctic peoples derived from their observations. We're gonna smash cut to almost 100 years later in our story here. I apologize for that. When I deal with objects and not uh, documentary sources, there's a lot more gaps sometimes. But we're gonna smash cut to 1867 and William Seward's purchase of Alaska from Russia. Uh, as you can see here, it was ridiculed at the time. Uh, trading uh, American technology and treasure for land in the Arctic seemed like a fool's bargain and depicted here as such. Uh, but it sets the stage for the Moravian mission in southwestern Alaska, because now, following 1867, the United States uh, has claim, in their eyes, legally owns this territory of Alaska, having purchased it from the Russian. And as such, they need to start administrating it. But there's a problem. 1867, the Civil War is taking its toll, reconstructions around the corner, and there's really no appetite for American imperial expansion yet at this point that would not come until later in the 19th century. Uh, and so what to do with this territory that America owns, but has very little to do with? Um, the answer, rather than send out the American military, rather than send out American uh, or federal institutions or federal agents to go and try to colonize this directly, there's a new plan. And it's the plan of this man, Sheldon Jackson, uh, the one of the administrators for the new Alaskan territory. Outside of the still very small kind of coastal cities that Americans occupied, much of Alaska remained uh, out of reach of Americans. Jackson had an idea though, as the Minister of Education, or I'm not the Minister of Education, but uh, Secretary of Education for the Alaskan Territory, he had some immense power and clout within there. He was responsible for uh, what would now 
be under the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, or uh, management within indigenous communities, as well as um, the schools directly. And of course, schools were also some of the only government outposts. They functioned as post offices. Uh, they functioned as notaries. Uh, they functioned in all kinds of uh, capacities. So through his control of schools, Jackson wielded immense power. And his idea to expand American presence within the Alaskan territory was to call on the power of churches, churches in the lower 48 or in the, I guess, in the, just the United States at that point. Um, he was very interested in feeling how he could essentially outsource some of this colonial labor into church organizations. And indeed, there's even evidence that Jackson came to Salem to pitch this to Moravian communities. And it seemed like it was effective because in 1885, uh, a missionary couple, as well as others uh, who did not stay in Alaska quite as long, but John and Edith Kilbuck, pictured here with their daughter, Katie Kilbuck in 1897, uh, went to Alaska and they founded the town of Bethel, which is today the largest city in southwestern Alaska. Uh, has about 3,000 people in it, so that gives you a sense of what the population density is like out there. But this is an immense territory, and they had a very difficult job of coming to southwestern Alaska and setting up this missionary effort. They uh, created Bethel near uh, an existing trade outpost and eventually began growing the Moravian congregation there. And they were incredibly successful at it, as I'm sure many of you already know. They were incredibly successful for several reasons, but one of the reasons was that John Kilbuck was himself indigenous, a member of the Lenape tribe. Uh, John was also Moravian. He occupied this interesting social category of being simultaneously Moravian and indigenous. Uh, and because of his knowledge of indigenous peoples in the United States, as well as the struggles that they faced and the prejudice and racism they faced, his approach to missionary activities was somewhat different, although not fair, not as different considering the broader scope of Moravian missionary activity. Uh, he immediately set about learning the Yupik language. He dedicated himself to conversing uh, fluently in Yupik. He translated church texts into the Yupik language. Uh, and he really respected, in a sense, more so than maybe other peers of his time, he respected the cultural practices. He understood the motivations and reasons for Yupik spirituality, for Yupik beliefs, even if he didn't necessarily agree with them. So here we have a sense of Alaska. It is an immense, an immense state. Uh, and Bethel is right there on the Kuskokwim River as it empties out into the Delta. Uh, as you can see, this delineation of territory represents the extent of traditional Yupik settlement and the Yupik villages within this territory. Bethel, smack dab in the middle, represented a central hub from which to engage in these missionary activities. So what did the Kilbucks want? Well, they wanted to establish a successful mission. John and Edith Kilbuck were, uh, lived in Alaska for almost 40 years uh, before John died there. Uh, and while they were there, they really earnestly wanted to set about a productive community and improve the lives of the people they were living with. What did they give them? Well, they brought in much of the trappings of missionary activity, education, infrastructure, government support, all of these uh, valuable commodities that the, Marie, or that the UPIC appreciated. But what did they take? And that's where our story intersects with the Museum of Anthropology and why I'm in this big museum warehouse right now. Uh, they took with them all kinds of things. Over those 40 years, they sent back hundreds of objects to the United States, hundreds of objects to Salem specifically. They sent objects of daily life, which I'll show now. So I know I'm sharing my screen, but I have a feeling that most of you can also see my talking head box as well. If you can, I encourage you to expand that talking head box as big as you can, because I have the objects right here with me and I'm going to very, in a very high tech fashion, hold them up to my camera so that you can get a glimpse of them. Some of these objects are in, uh, have better photos of them taken and are in the virtual exhibit, but some of these are not. Eric, comment. Yes, I was gonna say at the upper right corner, you'll see a, a, a choice within Zoom to swap the screens. And oh, you'll put the, uh, the upper right corner, you swap the, the share screen for your video, and that's how you get your head big. 
Swap screen. Okay. Up I the right am, corner. I am. Just swap I'm, shared screen with video, and that's how we get to you. If you say so. Yes. I can pause share. Do you think that would do it? Uh, you don't need to do anything. I'm just telling our guests if they want to see you rather oh, than. Oh, that's for the guests. I yes. Okay. I thought it was for yes. We time. want to keep you just like you are. You're perfect. Okay, great. So all of these objects were personally collected by the Kill Bucks and sent to home community members in Salem. They were sent for many reasons. Sometimes this is still the age of traveling lecture circuits. Uh, the Kill Bucks would come to Salem frequently and talk about their experiences in the Arctic, and they would bring back objects with them. They would also uh, sell these objects, quote unquote, or they wouldn't quite sell them, it wasn't so crass as that, but they would give them as gifts, often exchange for donations to keep the missionary activities afloat. Can't expand screen. I'm sorry, Carolyn, I wish I could um, help you with that, but um, I'm going to soldier on regardless. Objects of daily life like this, they tended to privilege objects that were of immense interest to the people, uh, to the Killbucks themselves or to the people back in Salem. This is a pretty typical bent wood container. Uh, it is uh, simply a container for everyday use. It doesn't have any special significance, but it does represent pretty quite clearly Yupik aesthetics uh, in creating everyday life. As you can see, it is painted with red dye. Uh, and then there's also black dye has been coming and painted on small depictions of animals like seals and caribou. You can also see, especially clearly on this view, why it's called bent wood. This is a kind of uh, uh, wood, as you might I'd imagine in the in the uh, swampy tundra of southwestern Alaska is a scarce commodity, uh, and every bit counts. So this is a thin uh, plank of wood that has been treated, soaked in salt water until it is pliable. It was then bent into shape, thus the name bent wood, and sewn together with additional strips of wood here, and then left to dry until it was in a hardened form. This kind of technology, this kind of ingenuity, fascinated the kill bucks, and they wanted to share this kind of technological sophistication with home communities back in Salem. Again, unlike some of their peers, the kill bucks were very interested in portraying the Yupik people very sympathetically, showing them not as, as other tropes of the time period might have them, not as savages or people in need of saving uh, in terms of their physical well being or their communal well being, but rather sophisticated and well adjusted to their social environmental context. Other objects of everyday life, this enormous ser serving spoon also carved out of wood, showing the sophistication and skill. And again, the attention poured into objects of everyday life, again, painted with geometric designs. They also brought in objects that uh, were other aspects of everyday life that maybe weren't as savory. Uh, this is a tobacco container, it's a uh, a quid box. So it would be used for small uh, quids of chewing tobacco. Uh, chewing tobacco in the Arctic was obviously traded in. Uh, no one grew tobacco in the Arctic. Uh, but when they acquired it, uh, Yupik people would often mix it with a kind of uh, lichen as well as minerals to produce a, um, um, a semi-psychoactive uh, effect alongside the tobacco when chewed at, at length. And this quid box is in the shape of a, a seal as well. The Moravians were also quite interested in hunting technologies. Oh, what time frame is this bent wood box? How is it used? Uh, so all of these objects were collected by the Kill Bucks between 1885 and 1922, 1925-ish. Um, in terms of how long that material culture, it probably extends back at least 400 years or so and an archaeological excavation ongoing at a site called Kinhagak in the south southern area uh, of the Yupik territory. Uh, archaeological excavations there have actually, because of the amazing preservation conditions there, have found wooden objects preserved that are at least 400 years old. Often wood is very difficult to preserve anywhere, so we know it goes at, uh, back at least that far. Um, most wooden containers have been displaced by plastic and metal containers today, but these are retained and the knowledge of creating them is still retained as a kind of a heritage craft. Uh, wonderful question. Uh, thank you, uh, Brooke, for asking. Uh, you want me to turn off the slide? Okay, I'll do that. I wasn't, I didn't want to keep turning it off and on, but you know what, that'll be just fine. So let me give you a better look again at that bent wood box. Uh, so here's the caribou face showing the wooden stitch uh, that is 
tying together the two ends, uh, as you can see where it, it's one continuous piece of wood that circles around and is then stitched together right here. I just wanted to remind, remind folks who are watching, some that are having trouble expanding the screen. If you have this not in full screen mode, that's when you see the option to get out of it. If it's in full screen mode, you won't necessarily have that option. I'll just keep going back, tacking back and forth between the awesome. share screen mode and not, I think that might just be easy for everyone. Uh, and here again is that, uh, that little quid box in the shape of this, uh, I think very adorable little seal. Some of my students disagree with me on it. Other objects that the Moravians uh, collected, uh, there was a, a preference for hunting technologies. And I think this goes again with this idea of portraying the Yupik as sophisticated, knowledgeable people who are very well adapted to what most others, especially back in Salem, considered a very inhospitable environment, the Arctic. And so hunting technology is very well represented in the collections that the missionaries sent back. Hunting technology is like this. No, these aren't Kanye West's sunglasses. These are hunting visors. Uh, they're snow blind goggles. You can imagine in the Arctic, especially during the winter months, uh, when hunting is a priority, when there is very little other gathering of wild resources, uh, hunting is very important. And being able to see your prey uh, becomes crucial. Being able to slowly approach and stalk your prey and, and secure the resources are, is of utmost importance. These snow blind goggles uh, reduce glare in two different ways. The narrow slits reduce glare both coming directly from the sun, from the oblique angle, it'll be bounced off the wooden frame, as well as bounced light reflecting up off the snow. So the, the narrow slit helps reduce that kind of glare and allow the hunter to adequately see their target. Similarly, hunting visors like this, again, made out of bent wood, hunting visors like this would be worn and also used to reduce glare. But while these tools were often interpreted as technology, sometimes the social dimension, the cultural meaning invested in these objects was lost. There's very little reference in contemporary sources of the Killbucks, and the Killbucks themselves are their contemporaries, uh, talking about the meaning of visors like this. Visors like this were worn exclusively by men. They were not considered sacred necessarily, but they were considered uh, gendered, and they were in and they would often be elaborated. The more successful a hunter was, the more elaborate their visor might become. So while the material culture was often preserved, not entirely was the meaning. The meaning was sometimes lost. Other objects, and these, this is the object the students always gravitate towards, uh, objects like harpoons. Marine hunting is incredibly difficult, uh, and taking down a large marine mammal is a group effort especially when you're hunting it with uh, simple technologies without the use of firearms, for example. So harpoons like this demonstrate kind of the, um, the skill that, or that Yupik hunters had. Uh, harpoons like this would be embedded in a marine animal like a seal or a walrus or a whale. Uh, the tip uh, comes off intentionally uh, and is tethered so that uh, rather than trying to kill the animal with a thrust, uh, the harpoon acts as a tether, dragging the animal and tiring it out until the animal can be, uh, can be uh, dispatched up close. Other objects that the Moravians collected were children's objects. There's a lot of children's objects. And I think this goes back to that lecture circuit. There is no, you know, there's no, nothing in the Killbuck's diaries that say we're collecting these objects for this reason specifically. Rather, a lot of it is silences that need to be interpreted about why these objects were selected over the entire potential universe of objects that are out there. But children's objects are very well represented. And I think it's because children sell well on the lecture circuit. It's very easy to empathize with children, uh, right? Especially when you're asking for donations to fund mission efforts. So there's a lot of children's objects. Children's dolls are very well represented. This is kind of a contemporary cloth doll that the Killbucks would have encountered. It already has heavily in, heavy influences from Russian uh, uh, trade and culture. Uh, you can see evidence of glass beads that the doll is wearing, as well as the glass eyes, trade fabric that the doll is clothed in, as well as the style of dress itself uh, is distinctly uh, European as well. So this doll would have been current when the Killbucks had already arrived. 
but they also collected archaic children's toys. Traditional ivory dolls like these made out of marine ivory uh, coming from walrus or a, or a sperm whale. Um, dolls like this would have been uh, kind of uh, old fashioned at the time that the kill bucks arrived, but nonetheless, uh, we're still circulating in society, uh, representing kind of maybe a, a more distant past uh, and something that the kill bucks uh, 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 were interested in and collected and sent back to Salem. They also collected some enigmatic objects like this, a yarun. This is a, an ivory knife, but it's not sharp at all. It has no real edge to it, but it is kind of uh, knife shaped. Uh, yarun like this are children's toys. And while I already mentioned one gendered object, that hunting visor, this too is also gendered. This is an object used by young girls. It is a storytelling knife. The yarun are used to depict uh, or to create pictures in the ground that uh, accompany kind of traditional stories and games. Uh, it's a, uh, a, a very elaborate tool, this ivory uh, this, uh, with scrimshaw etching on it, this kind of knife, again, shows the elaboration, the sophistication of material culture tested even in children's toys. While the Moravians collected, oh, before I get onto that point, the final thing that they collected were new crafts. And that's primarily what the virtual exhibit focuses on in every cultural context that it touches on. What kind of new material forms resulted as a, uh, as a, a product of Moravian influence within indigenous communities? And there are certainly many cases of that for the UPIC as well. Some of them I feel are quite funny, uh, like this, a letter opener. Uh, I don't know how practical a letter opener is when you don't have a postal service, uh, but it is pretty, it is cute. It's in the shape of a walrus, carved out of a walrus tusk. I always find that very macabre. There's so much ivory carving that is in the shape of the animal it came from. That always seems a little, I don't know, I guess macabre, as I said. But nonetheless, this walrus-shaped uh, letter opener, uh, this was probably exclusively made to send out of Yupik communities. And this is really where we see this begin. It doesn't happen earlier in Russian uh, influence in Alaska, but when the Moravians come, there's a new, there's kind of an explosion of new craft forms that are being created, many of which seem to be kind of souvenirs, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of small trinkets or kind of non-functional objects that nonetheless are symbolic of the place and people that created them and often intended to be used outside of those communities as well. But there's also the silences within this material culture archive, just as there are silences in any archive. Why, what isn't being mentioned? What isn't being saved? And we can think about that with the Moravian missionary collections as well. This is another uh, carved wooden bowl that was in our collection, but it's a very unique and special object. I think it's one that maybe escaped the notice of the kill bucks. Again, speaking on the visor, I said that sometimes the deeper cultural meaning was lost within a, a rush to talk about functionality of these objects. And I think that might be the case with this object. As you can see, modeled on the object, there's a small human face. It's a effigy bowl. This is a, a small lamp, uh, oil lamp. Uh, but with this human head on it, it takes on a very specific ritual and spiritual significance. It, was, it seems unusual that the Killbucks would have collected this object and sent it back to home communities, given that it was an example of the paganism that they were there to eradicate. Uh, the Killbucks did not collect any other kind of sacred objects typically and did not send them back. They did not collect idols. They did not collect masks. They didn't collect shamanistic paraphernalia. Uh, for the most part, they stuck to these other kind of ethnographic categories of objects of daily life, of hunting technology, of children's toys, of dress and clothing, of transportation, of small dioramas and models, all of those kind of typical ethnographic categories, but they did not collect ritual or spiritual objects. I think that this one made its way through only because they considered it simply an oil lamp and did not consider what the head on the end of it was signifying. Oh, are those remnants of white paint on the harpoon and the visor? 
Uh, on the harpoon, no, that's ivory that it's made out of. Again, a lot of materials are made out of marine ivory. On the uh, visor, yes, it is. That would have been one of these elaborations, although painting bent wood was not terribly uncommon as demonstrated by the spoon and box as well. Thank you, Brooke, for your question. All right, I'm gonna go back to sharing my presentation. An example of what they did not take, shamanistic masks. Yupik shaman masks are incredible works of art. Don't ask me, I mean, don't ask my opinion for it at least. I mean, ask the almighty dollar. The most expensive piece of Native American quote unquote art that was ever sold at auction was a Yupik mask for two and a half million dollars, uh, not oh, maybe only 10 years ago now. Uh, it was a mask owned by the surrealist painter Donati. Uh, and it was from uh, a collection by Adam Hollis Twitchell, a trader who lived in, uh, in southwestern Alaska, was a contemporary of the Killbucks, and Twitchell collected uh, dozens of masks. Uh, after shamanistic ceremonies, these masks would often be destroyed. Rather than destroying the masks, Twitchell was able to convince uh, the shamans, and from what we know that uh, it seems that this was a legitimate transaction, not one done under duress, uh, but nonetheless, he collected these objects uh, and then ended up sending many of them to the Smithsonian and many others he sold. These masks uh, would eventually fall out of practice uh, with the growing influence of Christianity. Masks like masking ceremonies and shamanistic ceremonies like this in general were often suppressed. Um, not violently, but certainly socially they were uh, suppressed. It's interesting then that masks like these were not collected. They were obviously quintessential examples of Yupik spirituality, of culture, of aesthetics, of deeply held beliefs, of interactions between humans and the environment. I mean, these are some of the most significant meaningful objects. And there's no doubt that the Killbucks were very aware of these masks. Uh, however, they did not collect any. In fact, as I mentioned, they didn't collect really any ritual or spiritual objects. So a very strong example of how material archives, just like written archives, uh, can be prone to silences and biases within their collections. Flash forward to 1959 and Alaska achieves statehood. Um, an incredible event, right? And with this, uh, new responsibilities, obligations, and opportunities for the indigenous communities living within. Uh, I'd like to show this photo after the previous one. Uh, this is approximately 40 years after the previous photo was shown. Uh, and as you can see, there still are masks uh, circulating within Napaskiak communities. Uh, Napaskiak is a small Yupik town just down the river from Bethel, quite close by actually. Uh, and in this photo, we see a group of Yupik children wearing these paper plate masks. And I like to show this image as well because it was taken by my great grandmother. Uh, my great grandmother was a Bureau of Indian Affairs school teacher within uh, Yupik communities for about 15 years, uh, stretching the 1950s uh, until, uh, well, she was, served in other Alaskan communities as well, but in Yupik communities until the late 1960s. Uh, and I don't think my great-grandmother knew anything about masking traditions. I've read all her journals, transcribed all her letters, and she doesn't mention them, them at all. And I don't think it was something she knew about nor really cared to learn about very much either. So I wonder if she was aware of any of the kind of historical resonance uh, between masks and the importance within Yupa communities. And then this photo she took of a craft project she undoubtedly led the children in. After nearly 100 years of Moravian influence, uh, Yupa people began to recontextualize what their culture meant. No longer was it simply evidence of kind of adaption to a uh, um, inhospitable environment or evidence of pagan practices, right? It had uh, no longer was culture cast in these Eurocentric terms or under the lens of missionaries who collected these objects. But now, uh, especially in 1995 with the founding of the Yupik Picariat Museum in Bethel, uh, Yupik culture has gone under a kind of renaissance, a revitalization of what it means to be Yupik and what material culture of Yupik means. In addition to that, in 2008, a Yupik language school 
was founded in Bethel, although unfortunately in 2015 it has burned to the ground and a new school building has yet to replace it. Um, something that I hope that uh, I can make contributions to as well soon. So all of this is to give a long historical narrative about how over the course of hundreds of years, Moravian people and Yupik people became enmeshed with one another and how the material culture that was sent back from Southwestern Alaska gives evidence to some of that context. All of this is a promotion, of course, for the value of object-based research. How can we conduct research on these kind of objects to understand more about the people who produce them? And I want to end, and I know I might already be going on, but I wanted to end if you'd, uh, if you'd treat me by showing an example that one of our uh, students here at Wake Forest University uh, conducted using some of these objects. Because now that they are in a museum, as Eric said, one of my interests in museums is to not just exhibit works, but to think about how these objects can continue to serve research purposes. Uh, some of the research that's being conducted on these objects. And I just realized I did not prep this ahead of time. So give me one minute while I pull it out of these shelves. Uh, feel free to please talk amongst yourselves. Um, I'm going to stop sharing as well here. All right, I'll be right back. You know, while Andrew stepped away, one of the things that's really been fun is to realize in all the inconvenience of COVID, uh, this kind of a live show would not have been possible if we'd had a live conference in one location here. We're able to share from your places where you are and actually go into Andrew's workplace and watch him. And so we really appreciate this opportunity today. I like his bookshelves, by the way. Except they're not bookshelves for book. him, they're object shelves. I like yeah, those remote shelving there. are no books there. on there. We might have Just, one book on you, there. You and Paul have the compact shelving. That'll be on my to-do list one day. Yeah, they're, they're, it's great. Uh, let me just see. Okay, while we wait for um, for Andrew to um, get back, I I just saw a really interesting e um, Q and A from Riddick, uh, one of our conference presenters, and um, I would like to um, share that with all of you. So Riddick writes, uh, "Thank you so much for your presentation and for showing these Yupik." objects, Andrew. A comment on cultural and environmental influences on the Moravians and on children's subjects. My great-grandparents, Ernst and Carrie Weber, were the second missionary couple in Bethel. My grandfather, Christian Otto Weber, was born in Bethel in 1892. We have photos of the family while they were in the States on furlough. He and his brothers are young boys dressed in traditional Yupik garb while their parents are wearing Victorian American clothing. My cousin still owns a kid-sized snowshoe. When he started his studies at the Nazareth Military School, Chris spoke Yupik more fluently than English. So the historical narrative is, is really continuing and it's crossing over in this concert, which I find fascinating. <laughs> That is a very, uh, very interesting story. Thank you so much, Riddick, for sharing that. Uh, and I hear exactly what you're saying about hearing from great grandparents about their experiences in Yupik communities, because that was something that I very much appreciated too. My great grandmother lived to be 101 years old. Uh, so I had the pleasure of knowing her for a very long time and hearing a lot of her stories there. Although of course, uh, I had no idea that eventually I would be managing uh, collections of Yupik materials uh, as part of my professional work. Um, so the object that I wanted to share then are these Yupik uh, caribou belts. And again, this is maybe the most enigmatic object. And there's actually three of them in our collection here that were sent back. These were personally collected by the Killbucks. And I don't believe that they uh, gave these out as gifts. I believe that these were retained by the family itself until donated to the Wachovia Historical Society. It, uh, blows apart my entire theory that the, Yupi or that the uh, Killbucks didn't collect any ritual objects because these three are certainly um, relate to a kind of spirituality that would be very much at odds with Moravian beliefs and practices. Uh, yet here they are. Perhaps maybe they were just so unique, so special that uh, the Killbucks decided to include them in their collections either. Or perhaps, 
as all research, I just need to find more examples of the kind of things they encountered in other collections to put together a more complete picture uh, of what there is. Um, before that, uh, questions, are there any efforts to increase archaeological digs and Bethel, especially with warming? Yes, there is. Uh, I don't know about Bethel specifically. I'm not sure there is a lot at Bethel, um, but definitely in Yupik communities at this excavation at Kinnegok, uh, which is on the southern coastal area uh, below the delta. That is being, I believe, led by the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, and they are working overtime. I mean, the reason that excavation is happening is because of global warming and because of the melting permafrost. That's why they're able, it's kind of a, a rescue operation. That's why they're able to pull out these amazing wooden objects. Uh, Martha also asked, what is the source for the wood? Uh, there are trees in the Arctic. There is some sources of wood, uh, and there is certainly driftwood that comes down uh, the YK River, the yukon Kuskokwim Rivers, and ends up in the Delta. Uh, um, but uh, it is still a scarce resource, uh, and it's still something that is, definitely has a lot of value and is definitely uh, intentionally used. Um, another comment from Douglas. I worked with uh, and was a friend of Ted and Kaka Leinbach. Uh, Catherine Schwalb was born in uh, Akiak, uh, Alaska in 1923 to Moravian missionaries. Did she and her husband contribute any objects to the collection? That is a great question. I will have to go through and look. As far as I know, all of these objects, uh, most of the objects in our provenance are actually associated with the donor who was likely a Salem resident and likely to never, never went to Alaska. Um, only if that donor recorded which missionary gave them the object is that known. And as far as I have in my records, the only reference missionaries are the kill bucks. Uh, so great question, something I would love to look into more. And I also know that there are other collections of um, Yupik objects collected by Moravians and other institutions. Uh, so I know that this collection is by no means the only collection. Uh, I am just only thinking about uh, the objects that made their way to Salem specifically. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, very interesting questions. Uh, so this caribou belt, or I guess I haven't introduced the object. The object in question is these healing belts. They're very interesting objects and they weave together quite a bit of Yupik culture. They're long uh, moose hide belts uh, that have been stitched all along with what looks like beads. You can see that there are blue beads, but as I bring it closer, you'll notice that the white beads, um, the white beads have kind of an interesting look to them. Uh, they're not quite what you might expect. These are rows and rows of caribou teeth, specifically the front incisor palette of caribou. Uh, as we all know, caribou actually only have one set of front incisors. Uh, they have no uh, top teeth. In fact, they only have this kind of bony plate and the bottom incisors clip against that when they're munching that grass. And of course, as ungulates, they have immense molars to grind all that grass up. But these front delicate incisors, smaller than human incisors, considering how big caribou are, all of these are the entire front plate. That gray material is the desiccated gums uh, holding the teeth in place. They've all been stitched together on this belt. There are 202 caribou palette stitched this belt, representing 202 distinct animals. Every single one of those animals was hunted by a single person. This belt represents the hunting prowess of a family, of a nuclear family, of a, of a, a male hunter, uh, a female wife, and their children. And it has a very interesting significance in that while all of the caribou incisors are supplied by the male hunter, the belt itself is made and worn by the women. Women would use these belts in a sense, and I'm going to do a terrible justice to the metaphysics of traditional Yupik spirituality, so I apologize on that behalf. But essentially, the hunting prowess, the skill, the manifestation of spiritual strength that is hunting is imbued in the belt, and it is added to by the spiritual strength of the woman to create kind of a composite object imbuing both male or masculine and feminine spiritual strengths. By virtue of the women wearing these belts, they imbue them with more and more energy. And when someone falls sick, is gets ill, these belts are draped over the person so that the energy then flows the other way, out of the belt and into the sick person to heal them. 
Uh, it's an amazing object, very interesting. And again, loaded with symbolism about hunting, gender roles, illness, uh, spirituality, all kinds of amazing objects or amazing ideas loaded into one object. Um, all right, more comments. Do, do, do. Were there more forests in the north? Um, in some parts of Alaska, yes. There are definitely lots of forests in Alaska. In the southwestern delta, it is a very swampy and kind of tundra-like environment. Um, there is not a lot of tree cover, um, and it differs pretty significantly with the boreal forests that are characterized other parts of Alaska. Um, Andrew, you see the question about if there are any archaeological digs that you know of in the Bethel area about just, indigenous just, uh, culture? Just the site of Kinhagak, uh, which I mentioned before, uh, which is the excavation led by the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I don't know of any other ongoing uh, excavations. There are some uh, on like uh, uh, on some of the Aleutian Islands a little bit farther away, but not within that YK Delta area specifically. Uh, the teeth look too tiny for a mature animal. I agree. They are the tiniest incisors. Uh, uh, but these are, these are from mature caribou. Uh, they, they definitely are. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can, uh, what we can do with that, knowing that they are from mature animals and what my students research did. Is it likely the Killbucks did not know that these were spiritual objects? I would say unlikely. Uh, John spoke fluent Yupik. Uh, Edith spoke Yupik as well. I would find it very unlikely that over the course of 30 to 40 years living amongst Yupik people, they would not know, uh, not know what these belts, which are very visible, I mean, very distinctive, what they would be used for. Maybe something like a small oil lamp that has a small effigy head attached to it, that might slip through the cracks, as I hypothesize. But a belt like this, where it has one very specific significance of use, would seem pretty unlikely for someone as knowledgeable of Yupik. Uh, great question, though. I am going to share my screen one more time uh, to finish this up. Um, all right, everyone can share this. I hope you can see this again. Can I get a thumbs up from uh, my panelists just to confirm that I'm sharing this accurately? Okay, you thank good. you. Eric. Thanks. So what I want to know is how can this object uh, be used to interpret it, its time and place? What does this mean in Yupik spirituality? What does this mean about colonialism, about missionary history, about global trade, industrialization, climate change? This is where I'm so proud of my Wake Forest students. A few years back, I had an amazing senior anthropology student uh, who, for her senior thesis, wanted to work with some kind of object in the museum, and she'd always been fascinated by the Yupik object. She had, had done an internship previously and had familiarized herself with our immense collections, and she wanted to do something here. I encouraged her to think about how objects can tell more than kind of cultural stereotypes. How can they be used for more than just like this belt is, or this belt is typically used in spiritual ceremonies? The exact kind of stereotype I just told you. Of course, while those are generally accurate, there's often little room for nuance or deviation or for looking at maybe more hidden histories embedded within the object. So I was very proud of her when she uh, went full into analyzing caribou teeth. Uh, and she realized that caribou teeth can tell us something about climate change. So with the help of Dr. Golden here in Winston-Salem, uh, he's retired now, unfortunately, but uh, he was my dentist. And, I, and he was a big hunter and he uh, would often go to Alaska to fish and hunt. I happened to, in the midst of uh, you know, getting my teeth cleaned, I happened to tell him about my student's project and about how she had all these caribou teeth. He was enamored and wanted to help out in any way he could. So a week later, there we were with the belt in the, in the dental chair getting x-rayed. Uh, uh, our students x-rayed every single uh, set of these teeth looking for, um, uh, what are they called? Oh no, um, there's small uh, uh, breaks in the enamel, enamel hypoplasia, there it is. Uh, they're enamel hypoplasia, these small lines, ridges in the teeth that are only appear under x-ray that show weaknesses in the enamel. But that weakness is not an injury, rather that weakness is because of the development of the caribou when they were very young. 
Hi enamel hypoplasias occur during periods of nutritional stress. When the animals aren't getting enough to eat, their body stops making this protective enamel on their teeth. And it has to be when they're very young, when these teeth are still developing, uh, sometimes even in utero. So what we see then is in here, in this belt, to make literal the metaphor of an archive, we have an archive in this belt of 202 unique individuals that were all taken from roughly a 10 year period, likely in the late 19th or early 20th century. And through that immense sample, 202 individuals is a great sample in biological studies. Uh, we can look at uh, evidence of enamel hypoplasia in individuals and compare that then to modern caribou herds, who uh, scientists are also measuring their uh, enamel hypoplasia as a means of measuring nutritional stress among these animals as it might relate to climate change. This is pretty important because scientists have recognized that caribou herds are suffering. There is, in, there is seemingly, seemingly, like I said, large incidences of enamel hypoplasia in contemporary modern herds. But what do we compare that against? Up until this point, there had been no historical control to compare modern caribou herds to. But now we have a hundred year old sample here. And guess what? A hundred years ago, one incident of enamel hypoplasia in one individual. This was a very, very healthy herd. It seems like something has changed in the past hundred years that is causing nutritional stress on caribou. And it's important to label it as climate change because climate change deniers in Alaska have stated that maybe caribou herd health is not related to climate change. Maybe it's related to overhunting by indigenous people. That's actually been put forward as a reason for caribou herd uh, destruction is mismanagement by indigenous people. But here we have evidence of amazing hunting prowess. One individual taking 200 caribou and not even over the course of their life. This would have been maybe over the span of like five to 10 years. And we can see there that there are, these herds are healthy. There is no nutritional stress happening here. This is not because of overhunting. You know, this isn't hunting related at all. Yupik people have been hunting caribou since probably there were Yupik people to hunt them. Uh, and it seems then that the cause of any kind of enamel hypoplasias occurring in the present must have generated from something that changed over the past hundred years. What could that have been? All right, so I'm gonna leave it there rather than keep soapboxing about climate change. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Eric again for introducing me and especially thank you to Orike and Grant for having me talk to everyone today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew, fabulous. And if you, we, we got a lot of questions and I was really impressed at the skill with which you were answering the Q&A on the fly. Uh, there, there's a lot of other love comments there that are we'll save for you. Uh, fabulous presentation. It's kind of fun when somebody's excited about their work. And I think you showed that today and I appreciate that. <laughs>